Welcome to XYPN Radio, where your host, Alan Moore, brings you into a community of fee-only financial planners who want to profitably and successfully serve Gen X and Gen Y clients. If you're ready to get the knowledge you need from leaders in your field, learn from forward-thinking advisors, and take action on your own goals, XYPN Radio is the show for you. Here's your host. Hello, and welcome to this episode of XYPN Radio. I am your host, Alan Moore. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am really excited because today's episode features Kaylee Hawk, who is the marketing manager for the XY Planning Network. So we get so many questions related to marketing that I wanted to have her come on and talk about the important pillars to your online marketing program, and more importantly, how to get help. As Kaylee emphasizes, we can't be great at everything. We can't be great at writing and marketing and being a financial planner and everything that goes into running a business. And being a writer is a skill set. And I'm a great example of this as as someone who wants to do marketing, but I'm not a very good writer. And if you listen to the end of the episode, you'll hear Kaylee and I talk about the process that we have for getting content out of my head to turn it into blog posts for the XYPN advisor facing blog. Now, remember that you can join our VIP community at xyplanningnetwork.com dot com slash VIP. A lot of questions that are a lot of things that we cover today are questions that we got in the VIP group. So I, I highly encourage you to join and interact with us there. We'd love for you to join and ask more marketing related questions. And maybe we can have Kaylee come back on the show for a mailbag style episode specifically on your marketing questions. You can find all the show notes and any of the resources that we mentioned on the episode at xyplanningnetwork.com slash 27. This month's episodes are brought to you by Financial Planners Assistance, providing compliance services to financial planners and other investment advisors since 1982. Financial Planners Assistance is a boutique consulting firm that provides the personalized compliance services firms are looking for. Check them out at financialplannersassistance.com, or you can go back and listen to our interview with their president and senior compliance consultant, Jim Cullen. All right, without further ado, here is my interview with Kaylee Hawk. Hey, Kaylee, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me on. I am excited to have you on. I can't believe it has taken 27 episodes for us to get you on the show because we get so many marketing questions. And as listeners may or may not know, pretty much all marketing related activities, anything you see from XY Plan Network comes from Kaylee. So who better to have on to talk marketing than the marketing manager for XY Planning Network? So yeah, I'll try to give it a go here. <laughs> <laughs> to kick things off, tell us a little bit about your background. You know, how did you get into I guess, how did you become marketing manager for XY Planning Network? What was your path? Sure. Well, I did not take a straight path. And I feel like that's probably a common theme that most people have when they're here talking about their career and how they got to where they are. So first and foremost, I'm a writer. I feel like that's what I'm good at. That's kind of like my talent or my gift. And I wanted to figure out how I could use that ability to kind of work for myself and freelance. So that's what I started out trying to do was, I mean, I'm going to be a freelance writer. As you are probably aware, it's probably very obvious to anyone who lives in the real world, that's really difficult to do full time and still feed yourself. So I started trying to expand and look into, okay, how else can I use my writing, but not necessarily, you know, write blog posts or pitch story ideas to editors all the time as my full time work. So that's when I kind of got into writing about money, talking about money. It had always fascinated me from the consumer side because I had a ton of questions about it. I was always asking, how do I make more of it? What do I do with it? And so I wanted to answer my own questions. And that's how I fell into financial writing. And from there, I realized um, there are a handful of financial advisors who were, you know, they were starting to have more of an online presence, kind of bringing that industry into the, you know, whatever century we're in now, 21st, 22nd? I think we go 21st. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. That's bad because I'm a history major. I should say writer, not history major. Got it. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, I, I, I saw that and saw that people were trying to be smart and use blogs and social media, emails, that sort of thing to reach younger clients. And that really resonated with me because I'm younger. I'm definitely a millennial. I kind of fall smack into the middle of that generation. But the problem was what I was seeing was either most advisors who were doing this were really overwhelmed and they had, you know, just way too much going on on top of trying to sit down and do something that they weren't naturally talented at or gifted at. And that's not a bad thing. We can't all be good at everything, unfortunately. But, you know, it was the, the writing content and sitting down and trying to organize all that stuff, working on websites, designing a website, they were really struggling with that either because there just wasn't enough time or 
they just weren't good at it. And I don't mean that to sound harsh, but again, it's like your specialty, your job is to sit down and work with clients. It's not to build a beautiful website or to write this really compelling blog post. So from there, I kind of saw like, oh, maybe this is a gap that I can fill and everybody wins. You know, I can do something that I enjoy and still work for myself. And I'm actually providing a valuable service to financial advisors who are interested in kind of getting into this content inbound marketing stuff, but don't have the time or the knowledge to do it. The first person that I reached out to, I cold emailed Sophia Barra, uh, who's an XYPN member. She's been on the podcast. I just sent her an email and I was like, hey, you look like you're doing a great job with your website. You've got a blog. I think that's awesome. But you seem really busy. Could you use some help? And she was like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> you really uh, just like cold emailed her. No, had no prior relationship, just reached out to find out if she was busy. We followed each other on Twitter, but I don't even think we sent each other any tweets or anything like that. It was just kind of a mutual, oh, you followed me, I'll follow you. Cool. You know, I, I'd seen her name pop up a few times in different places in that financial blogging space. When I went to go and check her out and learn more, I was like, okay, maybe this is somebody. But yeah, I just reached out and I was like, hey, you look like you could use some help. I can help. Are you interested? <laughs> so yeah, I just I just went for it and I got lucky with the timing, I think, because that was right when she was really ramping up and she was super busy and was all about getting some some help. So <laughs> it's amazing. That's actually probably one of the best people you could have reached out to because one, she actually needed the she was already doing a lot of the marketing stuff that, that you wanted to be helping with. But two, she's also very good at referring if she likes your work, which is actually how the end of the story ends with me meeting you and, and bringing you on at XY Play Network. But so a couple of things that you mentioned in kind of that part of your path. So one, you jokingly said history major. So you didn't get a degree in marketing or anything like that. I didn't know. Um, I didn't get a degree in marketing. I don't have any degree in finance either, anything like that, or even in business. And that's something that I actually, I'm, I try to be very forthcoming about. I, I definitely don't want to bill myself as a financial expert or anything like that. But yeah, no formal education as far as like a college degree in either one of those directions, marketing or finance. I think it's important to note that like ultimately there, like you said, there are different skill sets and we don't all necessarily go to college for the job that we end up doing. I mean, my degree is in financial planning and I really don't do a lot of financial planning anymore. I, I'm more of a business coach. I don't, I don't know technically what I would be considered, but you know, it's not always... The degree is not always indicative of where you're headed and it's more about some of it is really following your passion. And you said your passion was writing. So had you been writing for anyone else or, or any publications? Because I know you have your own blog, but were you doing anything outside of that or was Sophia kind of your first step into doing freelance writing for advisors and, and just people in general? Sophia was definitely my first, the first person I worked with who is a financial advisor Definitely the first person that I worked with or wrote for who like had a business. And from there, I kind of fell into that niche a little bit more. Initially, I had been trying to do like writing for blogs and like bigger corporate businesses that had blogs, but not entrepreneurs with small businesses. And as you mentioned, that's exactly how I, I kind of kept going was I hit it off with Sophia. We worked really well together. And yeah, she absolutely told everyone she knew about me and the work I was doing for her and how I was helping her. And that's really how everything kind of took off for me was just Sophia being very vocal and excited about what I was doing. And I, I endlessly appreciate that. And as you said, too, it's how you and I met. And then I started doing contract work for XY Planning Network. And then I kind of went from there. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people realize that you were actually our first hire you were a contractor at the time but you know we we had started working together for the initial launch of xypn so it's been it's kind of funny look it's been almost two years here coming up soon because I, I think we started working in february of 2014 on on kind of building the launch for april but so it's been kind of an interesting path so you were working full-time correct whenever you started freelancing with sophia what were you doing I was doing data entry for a small company. So pretty much the most soul sucking job you can imagine for someone <laughs> who likes to be creative and who also doesn't like to be told what to do or follow rules or <laughs> it was just very, Fair enough. <laughs> you know, one plus one equals two sort of work. There was no room for, you know, going above and beyond even. It was just very limiting. And I, yeah, I, I had to get out of that as soon as possible. <laughs> 
And so this kind of led down the path of you going and doing freelance work, quitting the full-time job, and then ultimately coming on board at XYPN full-time back in January, I guess, of 2015. Yep. That's where I started full-time. But yeah, we've been, it's crazy that we've been working together for almost two years. It, it wow. does not seem, yeah, that time flies sometimes when you're having fun. I mean, it has certainly <laughs> been a fun two years. So we wanted to have this episode to just talk some general marketing because, you know, Kitsis and I have gone back and forth on some of our mailbag, kind of our unhinged episodes with a few pieces on tips for, you know, getting your first few clients and, and different pieces like that. But ultimately, I'll say it because you'll probably hear throughout this episode, Kaylee is way too nice to say things like this. Financial advisors suck at marketing. Like, let, let's just call it how it is. As an industry, we are horrible marketers. And that's evidenced by the fact that if you talk to the vast majority of financial planners, every survey that ever comes out says that the number one source of new clients is existing client referrals. And that's great. And, and that should be a source of new clients because that means you're good at your job. And there's all these programs for like enhancing, getting more client referrals. And, and I don't know how effective those are. I, I'm sure I'll get some emails about it after, after the show goes live. But ultimately, you get client referrals because you're good at your job. You take care of your clients. And so anytime I hear that, you know, client referrals is number one source of new clients, all I can think of is that means you're not doing anything else. Or if you are doing other stuff, it's not very effective because you're not generating clients in any other way, whether it be through online content marketing, which is a lot of stuff we're going to talk about today, or in-person networking or center of influence networking or anything else, really, because the client referrals are going to come no matter what. It's like, what else can you be doing? But to your point, Kaylee, like, not everyone is a good writer. Not everyone is a good speaker. Not everyone is good at, you know, utilizing social media to have conversations. Not everyone's good at talking to reporters. So there's so much that you can do. So how do you recommend advisors, first off, even decide what marketing initiatives to take on? Because there's limitless number of directions that we could be pulled when it comes to marketing. Absolutely. Um, that I think that's the biggest challenge for anybody, any business. It, it doesn't matter what field you're in or, or even how big your business is. I think big to small, we all struggle with that. Like, okay, what are we doing? How do we prioritize? What comes first? And I think for everybody, the first thing would be you need to have a website and you need to have some sort of blog if you're targeting younger clients as far as Gen X and Gen Y. I think that becomes exponentially more important. Because one out of every four people ages about 18 to 30, the millennial generation, one out of every four of them trusts no one for financial advice. And that's huge. Like They don't trust their parents, they don't trust their friends, and they sure do not trust some guy in a suit you know, who's selling them financial advice, even if you're fee only, even if you're a fiduciary. So having a website, and that makes you easy to find because anybody under the age probably now will 60. You know, if, if they want to learn something, the first place they're going to go is Google and they're going to search for your name, your firm name, you know, financial advisors in their area, that sort of thing. And that's how they can connect with you first off is through a website. And if you don't have that website, if you don't exist online, you might as well just not exist to new clients because that's where they're going to go to learn about you, to understand who you are and what you're about. So I think that's the first thing. And, and yes, a website period is a marketing tool. Just having that, even if it's static, that is a form of marketing. So that would be the first one. And then the second one would be have a blog, some sort of a blog. It doesn't mean you need to write every day, every week. You don't even have to write twice a month. You could write once a month, just something that's out there and active and consistent. I think that's the most important thing is that you pick how much you want to write and you stick to it. The reason I say blogging, and I know probably a lot of people cringe at that because that means writing, Blogging is important because it builds trust, it builds authority, and it shows that you're an expert, it shows that you're credible, and it gives people a way to connect with you before they've even had a phone call with you, before they're you know doing research into you and that sort of thing. It just gives them something to understand, again, who you are and what you're about. And again, the reason that's so important is because people who are younger tend to not trust financial professionals, period. So a blog is a great way to get over that hurdle and to form a connection and to be seen as someone who knows what they're talking about and who can be trusted. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, focusing on website in general, I mean, this is it's digital real estate. Like this is your new storefront. 
I mean, this is your in basically the entire prospective client experience from learning about you to interacting with you all the way up through that first prospect meeting is all driven from the website. And I think advisors are really hesitant to spend money on websites. And I it just it baffles me because you can get a phenomenal website built by somebody that's a branding specialist that'll help you with your logo and just I mean, end to end for what, five grand? I mean, and that's really like top end level work. I think you can get a good website for fifteen hundred to two thousand now, and yet we won't spend that kind of money. But that's like the one place if you could only spend two thousand dollars on marketing for the next two years, I would say put it into a website. And again, these are the things that I can say because you don't have to. Is you know, if <laughs> I rarely recommend uh, website companies that cater towards financial advisors. And I know I'm going to get emails about this and I'm sorry, but ultimately most of the companies out there that are doing websites specifically for financial advisors, they do two things that really make me mad. One is they lock down the ownership of your website and you like rent it from them on a monthly basis for 40 or 50 bucks a month or hundred bucks a month, whatever that number is. And you never actually own the website. And I always recommend own that website because again, it's like the central piece to all marketing because everything we're going to talk about today ultimately flows to the website. So that's one piece is, is they tend to lock down ownership and the ability to, to edit and make updates and things like that. But also they tend to all look the same, you know, and, and anytime we talk marketing, I've joked before when I've been on stage to say, like, if you have another compass or another damn lighthouse on your website, you need to make a change because every other financial advisor has that same compass and that same lighthouse because they all end up looking alike. So like, be a little more creative and a little more unique when it comes to it. And I don't know, Kaylee, where do you recommend finding website designers? Because this is obviously something we've struggled with ourselves is, is finding good designers and good website folks. So are there places that you recommend folks go to find web guys or gals? The first place that I would look is before you even look at hiring someone, I would go and I would search through and find websites that you like websites that really appeal to you and you're like, wow, this looks really good. A lot of XYPN members have really slick sites that are super awesome and great examples. So the first thing I would do is go and look at those sites and kind of almost audit them, like go through them like you're you know, a normal user, ask yourself what works about this for you, what doesn't, and that'll give you an idea of what you want for your own site. Not saying, I, please do not copy anybody <laughs> and go rip <laughs> I've off I've seen that before. Website, That's but, not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, let's avoid that. But it should give you a better idea of what you like and what you don't, which is really important when you're communicating what it is that you want and don't want to a web designer or developer, because what they give you can only be as good as the information that you give them. So you need to know how to clearly communicate what it is in either direction, whether it's good or bad. Both are very helpful when you're working with somebody. As far as where to find it, I actually don't know of a specific resource that's kind of like a hub of designers or developers. What I would do is first look into your own network. If there are people that you know that are well connected, just reach out to them and ask for a referral to a web designer or someone who can build a website. People that you know, you know, know exponentially more people. And that's a way to get somebody that you maybe you don't know, but you have some sort of connection to. You've got somebody who can vouch for their work. Or if when you're looking at these websites, reach out to the person whose website you liked and ask, you know, who did you use for your web design? And do you have, you know, a number of names? Is there just one person? And even if you don't go with that one person, once you get in touch with someone who builds websites, they also are going to have their own network. So if it doesn't work out with them, they may be able to refer you to somebody else. I think that would probably be this way is start with people that you know, or start with people that kind of in your circles as far as other financial advisors, folks in XYPN, people in our community, our podcast community with that VIP Facebook group, go there and ask and kind of see where that leads you. I think that'll get you a better quality person to work with in the end, rather than just doing a random Google search or going to like a, a very broad job board. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I find that website design tends to be like ice cream flavors. Like I think everyone kind of likes ice cream, but everyone has their own favorite flavor. And so there's no one right designer for everybody. And it's really what speaks to you, but more importantly, what speaks to your target market. Because again, I know everybody that's been listening to several episodes of the podcast knows I'm going to say something about niche market and ideal client profile. So if you're if you specialize in working with older clients, you probably don't want to take a super new age 
you know, kind of web 2.0 web design, or maybe you do. I mean, it just kind of depends on whether or not they can even navigate it. But yet, if you look along the bottom of people's websites, a lot of times it'll say web design by so-and-so, but you can always ask for a referral. You can always kind of reach out and see. I, I do agree that, you know, go find some websites that you really like. When I was designing my site, now this was back in 2012, my designer said like, hey, would you, you know, find two or three other advisors websites that you liked? And I couldn't find any that I actually liked. So I had to go find like non-financial planning websites. Fortunately, in this day and age, there are a lot of advisors with their great sites. There's a lot of bloggers, which we'll talk a little bit here in a bit, but um, there's a lot of bloggers that have awesome sites. You can go out there and look at even food bloggers, personal finance bloggers. There's a lot of different folks that make their money having a great website. And that's the only way they make their money. So we can learn a lot from them. And, and like I said, there's definitely uh, ways to get in touch with people. I've never done it this way, but I have heard good things about sites like 99designs, which will do like, I think you can get your homepage and like four or five other pages designed by different folks. It, so that may be another random place to go look. But like Kaylee said, you can join our VIP community at xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP and ask for referrals there. And uh, usually you'll get quite a few good ones. So you were talking about a blog. I am convinced that advisors are sick of hearing that word because I don't think they know what to do with it. I, I think it's like, okay, so I have this thing that I could write some stuff about, but like, what do I write about? How often do I post? How long do the posts need to be? So can you just kind of give us an overview of your kind of your professional opinion on when it comes to blogging, what's important and sure. how often, where, sort of that sort of thing? Sure. I think the best thing to do if you're sitting and wondering like, okay, blog, if I'm going to do it, how? First pick, like we said, a, a posting schedule. When are you going to write and how often? It doesn't matter how often really. It's just, can you pick something that you can, can stick with and be consistent with and feel comfortable with? So once you have that, I would set aside some time, maybe 30 minutes to an hour, sit and brainstorm things you could write about. And you can do this in a couple of ways. You can first just sit down with pen and paper. And I would, I would, this offline, I would not do it on a computer. There's something about moving your hand across a page that really changes how you're thinking as you do things. I feel like it, I, I don't know what it is about it. I can't tell you exactly why, but I've experienced it myself. It's just a different process and more good stuff comes out of it. So if you sit down with your, your pen and paper and just write down everything that kind of gets you jazzed up about financial planning or the people you want to help. You know, write down phrases, keywords, ideas, questions, anything that comes to mind as far as what do you have to teach somebody or what do you feel like you could write about for days? And another exercise would be to imagine your ideal client, which I'm going to, um, it helps to have a niche and a client profile. It does. And this is why. If you can have a very specific person in your mind, imagine that person and sit down and brainstorm a list of questions the person has. What do they want to know? What are they struggling with? You know, what are their hesitations? What are their pain points? What's going through their head? If you can write down like a list of questions or struggles, then you can create a second column next to those questions and write out the topics for the answers. And that second column, the topics for the answers, those are your blog posts. Because the whole idea with inbound marketing is to create a platform where people naturally want to be. They're at your website, they're on your blog because they were searching for this information and they found it with you. And now you're suddenly someone who offers immense value to them because you've given them this answer, you've alleviated this pain for them. And that's huge. You know, you've already given them something of value just by writing up, you know, something that seemed very obvious to you or like common knowledge as a professional, you know this, but these people who are searching for the answers, they don't. So that's where I would start as far as for content ideas. On the more technical or, or nitpicky side of things, longer is always better. And that's why I think it's much better if you sit down twice a month to write a thousand to two thousand word blog posts. I know that sounds like a lot. That's really scary. But you only have to do it twice a month. So it, you can do it. I believe in you. I mean, is it 500 <laughs> words about one page of typed content? I mean, so we're talking two to three pages of content, right? Yeah. That's I would not, aim for that. Yeah, that's not all that much. How many five page papers did we have to write in college? At least a million. <laughs> so Exactly. And when it's a topic that you are excited about, so that's why you start with that. What gets you excited? What do you want to sit and write about or teach people about? It becomes very easy to write that amount. 
So I would aim for longer is better. And if you need to post less frequently to get to that, do that. I, I think that's the best way to go. And then let's see, Alan, what else, what else did you ask me? <laughs> well, to that point, we had Jeff Rose on during our launch week of XYPN Radio, and he talked about this where he used to do a bunch of four to 500 word articles. And then Google made some algorithm changes to their search and completely tanked his website. I mean, he basically lost all of his traffic overnight and he has moved to, I believe, a once a week schedule, but a really in-depth guides. So, I mean, one of his more popular posts I remember was like how to go or how much does it cost to go on a week long RV trip? And I mean, that thing had to be four or five thousand words. It was really, really in depth, but he has killed it with that article because anyone that's out there looking for, hey, how much does it cost to go on an RV trip is going to find his post. And, and, you know, Kayla, you mentioned some words like authority earlier, and and there's kind of two pieces that we're talking to. One, we're talking to the end consumer, right? We're trying to reach the end consumer to let them know, what are you an expert in? What are you passionate about? What are you the most knowledgeable person out there on? And then two, we're trying to gain credibility and authority with Google because ultimately that's the dominant search engine and Google has their own little internal algorithms and anyone that tells you they know how they work is lying because no one knows and they change it all the time. Sometimes they tell us six months after they made a change that they made a change. But ultimately, we're trying to tell Google, hey, we are an authority on this topic. So when someone searches for, you know, is some specific topic or asks Google some specific question that they know our website is an authority on that topic and it will rank you higher than other people that are out there. And again, this is why it always comes back to niche market. It's really hard to write broad based conversations. If you think like, who am I going to write to in terms of like a general client base? It's like how to open a Roth IRA, how to select social security age. Like it's too broad. It's too hard to focus. So if you can focus in and say like, I'm going to be the expert on new parents, like Matt Becker with mom and dad money, go read his blog, go look at the content he's producing all about new parent specific topics. And he can be very, very focused, which is huge. So I totally agree that blogging is really important. What is the frequency that you recommend? Does it really matter? Is there like a prime or is it just as much as you can? I definitely don't think it's as much as you can. And as you were saying with Google's new algorithms and stuff like that, I agree that anybody who tells you they understand them, they do not. Um, (laughs) But from what I can tell, it seems like Google is now rewarding people who posts less frequently, but with more in-depth, meatier, longer content. Mm. So as far as frequency goes, Google prefers meatier, longer content. So it's not so much about frequency, although if we're talking about to not beat around the bush and give you a specific amount, I would say aim for twice a month and make those two posts really, really good. Hit it out of the park with those two. If you can only do it once a month, that's fine. Don't beat yourself up about it or don't say, you know, I can't do it twice a month, so I'm just not going to do it at all. Something is better than nothing here. So to get started, try to do it twice a month. If you want to do the first and the 15th of the month, if you want to do it every other Wednesday, whatever works for you. But I would aim for that. And be consistent, right? If you're going to do it the first and the 15th, just do it the first and the 15th every month. Don't be like people start to expect content. I remember the first we had a podcast episode go a day late because of some issues on our end. And like I was getting a lot of emails like, hey, where's the new episode? Hey, hey, where is it? Because we set the expectation every Wednesday morning, you're going to have a new podcast. So if you establish weekly or you establish monthly or whatever, be consistent. Right. And I would push. I mean, personally, I push for weekly simply because I think that just from a pure ideal standpoint, I, I remember there were some FinCon bloggers talking. They said it takes 100 blog posts to before you should see any results. So I remember doing the math and being like, okay, at one a week, it's gonna take me two years to get to 100. And I don't want that to stress people out. I think it's more just understand that like, blogging is not a short term fix. It's not something you just like put out three blog posts and you get 80 clients or anything like that. But if you are consistent, you produce good content, like I said, in-depth content that really caters to your target market. And I and we could talk a little bit about distribution, but if you focus on that side of it, it'll make a difference in the long run. So what do you Absolutely. I think that's an important point too that you mentioned blogging is a long term game. And if you're not willing to sit and play it for a while, then you know, you, you need to kind of realign your expectations and uh, what you think you're gonna get out of it because it's not something that there is absolutely no such thing as an overnight success when you have a blog or anything like that. So know that and if you're not getting 
traffic or you're not seeing an immediate response or reaction or something, that's natural. And the only thing that's missing is time. So what happens if I'm not a good writer and I'll put myself in this boat? I'm honestly just not very good at sitting down and writing. It is pain. It's a painful experience. It takes forever. I'm really not good with grammar. Microsoft Word only helps me so much. So like, what are the options for advisors that say, hey, okay, this is great. I want to be doing this, but I suck at it. I mean, what, where do you send them? I mean, are there, are there other mediums instead of blogging that you recommend? Like, okay, just go do podcasts or just do video. Or if they're going to do blogging, like how do you help them? Well, first I would say congratulations for accepting that you're not good at everything. Um, That's huge. (laughs) And to be able to let that go, that's a big deal. So to recognize in yourself, like this is not something I'm good at is a big thing, but that doesn't mean you can't have a blog. It just means you need to go and find someone to help you. So As far as on the blogging part, there are plenty, plenty of people out there who do freelance writing, freelance blogging. They do it on the side. It's like their side hustle. There are even financial advisors who write on the side. So you've got this whole community of financial bloggers. You've got your fellow financial advisors who, you know, maybe they're looking for some extra income on the side if they're still working in somebody else's firm, or they're really looking for some extra income if they've just started their own firm and they kind of need to fill that income gap. These are both great places to go and find someone to help. I'd say financial bloggers because they're at least familiar with personal finance content. Not everybody knows the really in-depth technical stuff. So you may need to work with them on that or you may need to figure out a way to kind of help them help them help you as far as you can educate them a little bit or they can perhaps get a post started for you and you can finish it. But if you seek out a financial advisor or maybe a planning student, something like that, they are going to be a little bit more familiar with the detailed technical aspects of what you may want to write about. So to find those people, again, there's your own network of peers, other financial professionals. They likely know somebody or they are somebody who would like to work with you on a part-time virtual contract basis. Or you can seek out communities of freelancers. And there's, there's a lot out there. The ones that I recommend the most, you can start by going to ProBlogger. That's just ProBlogger.com, I'm pretty sure, but we may need to check it. Maybe ProBlogger.net. Um, yeah, but we'll, if you just we'll throw Google a link search, in the show notes. Yeah, if, if you Google search ProBlogger, it'll come up. And they have a job board, and you can post an ad on there for 50 bucks, and you will probably be flooded with responses because it's a very, very popular job board. But you can go on there and you can explain you know, what you're looking for, what kind of qualifications uh, you'd like somebody to have, either you know familiarity with freelance writing, how that works, familiarity with financial content. You can list out how much you'd like to pay, all that kind of good stuff. So that's one way and you can kind of get people coming to you. or one community, I should say. Another community that I always recommend and that I send XYPN people to is Carrie Smith of Careful Sense. She has something called the Client Connection. And she has this big, huge network of of hundreds of freelancers, many of them focus or have backgrounds in some sort of financial writing. I'm, I can't remember exactly how many hundreds, but it's it's many hundreds it's a of, bunch, of people yeah. yeah, that she's gathered up. And um, out of those people, they'll they pay her, not not all of them, but to be in this community, they pay something like forty bucks a month to receive listings from people like you who are seeking writers or VAs or social media managers, that sort of thing. So if you go to carefulsense.com forward slash client hyphen connection, um, it'll pull up a form where you can fill it out and it's free for you. It's free for you to use. You just put in what you're looking for. Again, all those details. And she sends that out to her network of people and you'll get folks contacting you directly, perhaps writing samples or that sort of thing. So that's how you can find someone to essentially ghostwrite for you on your blog or, you know, any kind of content that you're pushing out. And you need to be really specific. So this is a great example. I mean, you say go to ProBlogger. If you post a generic, I'm a financial advisor looking for blog posts, you're going to get 4 million responses. But if you say like, hey, I'm a financial advisor that's writing content focused on working with professional athletes. I'm looking for a writer that understands some of the you know financial situations of professional athletes. Please send a few sample articles that you've written in the past and, you know, have in-depth knowledge about some of the different pensions or taxations or things like that for this community, you're going to get like three responses and they're going to be super duper high quality. (laughs) Um, 
So I guess now is a great time to let the cat out of the bag. I do not write any of the content on the XYPN blog. I'll admit it. Even though my name is associated with, I think, all of the advisor facing content, I don't write any of it. And the reason is because I suck at writing and Kaylee's really good at it. And truth be told, Kaylee also has a team of freelancers that help her with writing for our blog and our consumer blog. And so I want to give a couple points or just a couple tips, I guess, that we have learned over working together for the last two years in getting content. So, you know, sometimes advisors just think like, oh, well, I'll just give the writer a topic like retirement plans for major league baseball players. And that's great, but that's really broad. And truth be told, no one's more of an expert than you are. So one of the ways that that we have started working together, and we've we've done quite a few blog posts. We wrote an ebook. We're in the process of writing a new book. Uh, don't tell anybody. In order to get content out of my head so that it can show up on the blog is to do recordings. And so what I do is I have an app on my phone. Um, I'd have to pull up what the name of it is. You can download any free app, basically. And I just record myself talking for five to 10 minutes and just about whatever topic it is. So recently, actually, an article that Michael and I talked about from Miss, uh, I can never say her name, Miss Jug, that was basically saying young clients didn't need to work with a financial advisor. Uh, We wrote an article in response to that and, and published it. That was done this way, where basically I just recorded myself basically talking about the topic very angrily for, I don't know, seven minutes. And then you were able to take that content and turn that into an actual written blog post, which I think is huge because it was my words without quite the anger, but it was written in a way that communicated my words better than I could have because I'm not a good writer and you are. And so I I think that that's just one example of finding something that works for you as an advisor to be able to get the content out and finding a writer that could be part of your job posting is I'll provide you a five minute recording. I want you to turn that into content. Is that pretty common or are we breaking new ground here with this? <laughs> um, from what I can tell, I, I don't know a lot of people that do it that way, but I think it works out really well. It's a very efficient way to go. And it also sets kind of everybody up for success because on those blog posts that are written that way, where, where you sit down and you record something for 10 minutes, which a, a 10 minute recording gives you about a thousand words of written content from our experience. So you're able to talk on these topics that I don't have the expertise in, or I don't have the knowledge in. You're able to sit, talk through, write it, and then edit it to make it a flash piece of writing. Um, that works really well. And it also, it, it takes the pressure off of me to write things that I don't know. So if you have a freelancer, you can definitely do it that way. It's it's much more efficient for you. You're probably going to get a finished product that you're happier with. And then you can let them, you can still work with them as far as give them a topic and perhaps an outline and let them write if, you know, it's in their specialty. So like the marketing content on our advisor basic blog, I write that usually by myself. But the other content, it's done through that recording style, which works really well. Like I said, it's it. It makes my life a lot easier because I have all the information right there. And I think it makes your life easier, too, because you don't have to sit down and write a thousand word blog post, which could easily take you two hours. You sat and you talked through something that you knew, you know, for 10 minutes. Yeah, it would take me two to three hours to get a thousand to fifteen hundred word blog post. And and this is just like I've learned my skill set is more with audio. That's why we have a podcast and not so much with written content. I just don't communicate well through the written word. I prefer to, to talk it out. So, yeah, so it allows me to tell stories. We can incorporate stories, things that I've experienced. And so it's coming from me. And I'll kind of tangent just a little bit. And one thing that advisors have brought up with me is, hey, is it ethical for me to hold, you know, to basically publish blog posts that I didn't write. Cause what if I don't have an area of expertise in this area? There's some compliance concerns around that. And what I would say is if you're doing it this way, where you're recording yourself talking for 10 to 12 minutes, and then someone is turning that into a blog post, they are your words. It is your expertise. You're not faking it by using a ghostwriter. You're simply leveraging someone else who has a skill set in writing that you may or may not have. And to be clear, this is not a transcription. We are not saying like, okay, you know, Kaylee, just take everything I just said and turn it into a blog post because that would be a horrible post. It's more about, hey, here's the content. 
and gives you kind of a, a starting place, a half written page to kind of finalize. And I think that's what's so critical. So, and I actually didn't even know, uh, this is kind of what we have found works. There are other ways to do this. You may just be able to give a few bullet points and, and turn that over to a writer, but I agree. I think that you're going to find a much more finished, complete quality product by allowing it to be your words instead of putting out just random stuff that a writer is doing. So to kind of wrap up what we're talking about, I mean, this is one way of, of outsourcing. And I think it's critical. Again, not everyone is a good writer. And I think that it's okay to admit that that we don't all have that skill set. So we've talked about, you know, pulling it all together. And this is actually a, a conversation piece that came off Matt Becker's episode uh, earlier this year is it doesn't matter how good your content is if no one can find it. <laughs> it's all about distribution. And I'll pick on Michael for a second. Uh, Kitsis and I always talk about the fact that he's producing, you know, 4,000 word blog posts three times a week. And yet it's almost too much content because the effort is put into content creation, not enough around distribution, but that's his passion. So he's going to keep doing it. But as an advisor, you don't necessarily have the time that Michael has invested and, and continues to invest in writing. You know, So if you're producing one blog post a month or one every two weeks, one a week, whatever that is, what are the best and most effective ways that you found to really get that content distributed? And is there a way to, I guess, outsource some of the work that comes with distribution of that content? Sure. I think the first thing you need to do is get into the mindset that, you know, with a blog, with any kind of content, 20% of your time should be spent creating it and then 80% should be spent promoting it. So, yes, you should be out there kind of in the pavement with sharing this thing and getting it out there. You should spend much more time and energy doing that than actually writing. So there's a couple of different ways you can do it. And probably the biggest and most obvious would be social media. That's a great way to share what you've written, get it out to a wider world. And hopefully once it's out there, you know, a few people will help you out by, by sharing it too. Maybe they'll like it and include it somewhere else. You can also be proactive as far as reaching out to people, bloggers, reporters, other writers, um, even other financial advisors, reach out to them and see if, you know, if they have a, a podcast, can you be a guest on the podcast? And then you can promote your site and promote your blog as a whole. Same thing with guest posting on other sites. You can get out there and write good content, have it on their site with a link back to yours. Um, these are some ways to kind of promote yourself in general. To promote an individual post, I have a process that I kind of went through as far as I republish it everywhere that I can, which means LinkedIn. You can always publish your own content on your LinkedIn profile. You can republish stuff on Medium, that's just medium.com. You can see if you can get your content syndicated somewhere, which would be a place like Huffington Post, Business Insider, US News. All of those sites syndicate content instead of just constantly producing their own. So if you're writing really excellent content, there's a good chance that you could reach out there and get your stuff syndicated. So I would be proactive about looking for those opportunities. And don't be afraid to send a cold email or two. I would suggest making that a slightly or email by connecting with somebody on like a reporter or a writer, connect with them on LinkedIn, connect with them on Twitter, maybe send them a few tweets uh, so that they at least recognize your name and always frame your cold email promoting your own thing in a way that you're trying to add value to them. You're trying to help them out instead of just promoting yourself. And maybe an example of that could be, you know, I don't know if you're looking for more stories for this column or if you're looking to syndicate more content but if you are, you you know, maybe you can take a look at mine and see if it if it works out for you, if it's if it's good for your platform, please feel free to use it. I would also look at making sure that you publish your posts or share them more than once on social media. I would build out a calendar uh, maybe three months out and just have little reminders in there that you share that post every other week or you share it, you know, three times the week it publishes, twice the next week, and then once every week after that. You know, something like that. There's no hard and fast rule, but just remember to reshare old content too. Don't just push new stuff. Let's see, what else could you do? Um, if you're on Instagram, you can put a link to that specific blog post in your profile. You can promote your blog overall or maybe an email list instead I'm in your email signature. It's just looking for those little opportunities like that to kind of sneak a link, link in here or there. No, I totally agree. And this is where it comes back to, and I know everybody's sick of it, 
ideal client profile. If you're writing really specific content and it's geared towards a very specific target audience, it's much, much easier to have a conversation of where to distribute your content because you'll know where your ideal client lives. And so if you work with newlyweds and all of your content is around financial decisions for newlyweds, I'm betting that you can get some of your content produced on, is it the nest? Is that the, I'm trying to think there's the bump for new parents. I think it's the nest for newlyweds. They'll syndicate your content. the, The knot. The knot. There you go. Um, (laughs) Thank you. So the knot.com, you know, you can go on there and write content for them because it's geared towards their target market. They're looking for good content and it links back to your content that's on your blog. You can be very specific. If you're the generic financial planner that writes generic content that caters towards everybody, it means it really doesn't cater to anybody. So the more specific you can be, you know, whenever you're reaching out to guests, you know, to guest post places or, you know, for folks to share your content, you can kind of push it through those distribution channels because that's their target market and people are always looking for new content, content to share. Because we're talking about creating content's tough and to have someone that's willing to write for you, heck yeah, you know, people take you up on that. So we do that from time to time on our blog. I know a lot of bloggers out there willing to do that have very large audiences. So, and I love your 20-80 rule, 20% creation, 80% distribution, because I would suspect that most people are 80-20, if not 95-5. We tend to focus so much on content creation, which is actually the really, really hard, time-consuming, creative, juice-draining process. And yet we forget to do distribution, which is actually the easy part. It just takes some time and focus. Right. Absolutely. So you think of it that way. I mean, the creating part is the hard part. So don't let all that hard work go to waste by funneling all of your energy just to do that. Because unfortunately, nobody's going to pluck you out of, you know, the big wide web out there of all the content they could read, the likelihood of someone, you know, picking you and and putting the spotlight on you without you doing any kind of proactive work is very unlikely, no matter how much your content deserves it or or how good it is. Content is king. I, I believe that. But promoting that content and getting it to the right channels is worth more time and attention. And as you mentioned, you can get help with that, whether it's through Carrie Smith's Client Connection Portal or ProBlogger or some of these other resources that are out there. You can get help in terms of somebody to help you do some follow up, help you do some, you know, reaching out, you know, analysis of what guest posts you should be doing and for who and all of that. So don't feel like you have to do this all yourself. There's a lot of people with a lot of great connections and you can hire them to help you with this. So, Kaylee, thank you so much for being on the show. We're going to have to I know we're going to get a ton of questions off this. So what I would say is for listeners out there, be sure to join our VIP community. It's xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP. You can ask Kaylee questions there to get some marketing opinions. Uh, But if we get enough questions, then we'll have you back on and we can do like a mailbag of sorts where we just go through a bunch of questions uh, specifically related towards marketing uh, and and content marketing, inbound marketing, things like that. Because I know This is such a broad topic. We could talk for days and days and days on it. So I'll be interested to see what the questions are that come in from it. But thank you very much for being on the show today. This is a ton of fun. We'll have to do this again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. And and definitely, if you have questions, that makes it a little bit easier to talk about. Because as you said, Alan, marketing is this huge, big thing. So if there's some specific questions, that gives me something really targeted and focused to talk about. So yeah, that would be awesome. All right. Sounds great. Well, thanks so much, Kaylee. Thank you. That was so much fun. I love talking marketing, even though I'm honestly not all that good at it. But by teaming up with experts like Kaylee, we've been able to build a pretty strong brand and marketing engine for the XY Planning Network. And I think you can grow a similar marketing platform for your financial planning practice that we've grown for XY Planning Network. And I think that starts with making a commitment to marketing, really defining that target market, and then hiring people to help you in areas that you're weak in. So hopefully this interview gave you some ideas and resources on how to take the next step towards growing growing your firm. Now, remember, you can find all the show notes and resources mentioned in this episode at xyplanningnetwork.com slash 27. This month's shows are brought to you by Financial Planners Assistance, providing compliance services to financial planners and other investment advisors since 1982. Financial Planners Assistance is a boutique consulting firm that provides the personalized compliance services firms are looking for. Now, I've personally worked with Financial Planners Assistance since launching my firm back in 2012 and can't say enough about the awesome service and support I've received, including going through an audit by the state of Wisconsin. You can check them out at financialplannersassistance.com and also check out our interview with their president 
President and Senior Compliance Consultant, Jim Cullen. Thanks so much for joining me today. We'll see you next time. You're not alone and you're not crazy. It's scary starting, building, and growing your own financial planning firm. And that's why we put together a free private community just for you, the Cutting Edge Financial Planner. Go to xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP or text XYPN Radio to 33344 and join a network of thousands ready to change the lives of Gen X and Gen Y clients.